Yup, what's good, original crew, man? We're back. We got a new Mr. Ballin. Mm -hmm. Top three crazy ways people escape death, part three. Mm. See, I always talk about her escape. <laughs> I've escaped some things. Well, yeah. Okay. Never mind. Never mind. I ain't gonna speak on it. But you have. Okay. You have. Mm -hmm. But, uh, oh, PSA. If you checked out the previous Mr. Ballin video, we do apologize for the white noise. Uh, we tried to go in, even correct it. It couldn't be corrected all the way. So, we do apologize for the previous white noise. We try, we try to make sure it doesn't happen. We done had a whole recording session. We recorded like, what, 10 videos? Oh, my God. And that's every not... video had white noise, and we that's did not put any of those videos out. Oh, that's... Don't so that was me. a waste of a day. Oh, my goodness. You don't... You talking about hurt. That's that's four or five hours of doing videos. I was hurt. And you can't put it out. So <laughs> yeah. just know we tried not. Just hope this one is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We ch well, we... Wait. We checked pre prior. Yeah, we did check. So... It's a, a motorcycle. But uh, we try to check pr uh, prior to every video now going forward to make sure there's no hissing, white noise. Sometimes it will happen. And yeah. it just unfortunately is not our fault. But we try to prevent it. So uh, thank you to those who did still check the video out. Thank you. Yeah. So, but with that being said, make sure y'all check out the links in the description box. Down below. You already know where to go, man. You want to first part, all you got to do is check out down below. Also... If you enjoyed today's video, like it with a thumbs up. We highly appreciate it. But you ready? I'm ready. Let's get into these <clears throat> top three crazy ways people escape death. Yeah. Part three for us. Let's go. Today's top story is easily one of the most incredible true stories I have ever heard. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. Quite so if that's of interest to you, please secretly follow the like button into a grocery store and then ram the back of their heels with your cart. Also, please... <laughs> don't ever do that because somebody might whoop your ass for that. That is what something you don't do. Yeah, that, that that's. I accidentally did it to. That's us. definitely a whooping. Mm. I've actually accidentally did it to you before, and it, but I've had it done to me before, and that that's one of the most. I don't know if it was an accident. I'm just fine. Subscribe <laughs> to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 1983, 23-year-old Tammy Ashcroft was engaged to 34-year-old Richard Sharp. The couple had bonded... <laughs> 1983, 23-year-old tw Tammy Ashcroft. C, C, C. He just kept naming... <laughs> I repeated it in my head. What? Like uh, 23. Her name is Tammy. Tammy. And how old was the husband? What, a boyfriend or whatever? And you paused it. I, I didn't he get it. He was 30-something. In 1983, 23-year-old Tammy Ashcroft was engaged to 34-year-old Richard Sharp. The couple had bonded over their shared love of sailing, and generally they spent more time on the water than on land. In October of that year, a friend approached the couple and asked if they'd be willing to take their 44-foot yacht from Tahiti to San Diego. Though the trip would be over 4,000 miles long, significantly longer than any one trip either of them had ever taken on the open water, mm. they both felt very confident in their seafaring abilities, and so they agreed to do it. The journey started out fine, but at the two-week mark, when they were just north of the equator, they heard about a hurricane that could be making its way up to where they were going. Mm. And so even though they anticipated it would kind of peter out and actually not even hit them, they decided it was still in their best interest to try to sail completely away from the path of the storm to safer waters. 
But over the next couple of days, the storm only intensified and continued to change directions, making it really hard to predict where safer waters was going to be. And so Tammy and Richard kept desperately trying to get farther and farther away from the storm, but it was like every time they would change course and get farther away, the storm would speed up and change directions and still be coming straight for them. Wow. And so finally, it got to the point where Tammy and Richard realized they could not actually outpace the storm, that they would have to weather it. And so on the day it was going to hit them, they donned their rain gear and they boarded up the windows and then they stood on the deck of their yacht looking out at the horizon as this category four hurricane is just mm. barreling straight towards them. Tammy would go on to say that she never fully appreciated just how terrifying being in a hurricane is out at sea until she was in one. She said it was a constant barrage of 50 foot waves that would literally launch the yacht. It would become airborne and then it would come crashing down. Yeah. And each time it landed, she felt like the boat was gonna break in two. And then as soon as it did slam down, another wave would land on top of them. And so it just felt like at any moment, the ship was just gonna be consumed by the ocean. But Tammy and Richard were excellent sailors and Richard was up in the cockpit and he was doing everything he could to keep the boat from not flipping over. Yeah. And after a little while, he had figured out a way to kind of ride the waves in such a way that they would not get totally tossed each time. And after a couple hours of just absolute chaos, it started to seem like they had made it through the worst of the storm and that more than likely they were going to make it out of this thing relatively unharmed. And so around this time, as the storm was beginning to calm down, Richard is anchored in place in the cockpit. He's a safety line attached to him to the ground, so he's not going anywhere. And Tammy is just exhausted. It was just so stressful being through the storm. And Richard noticed, and he says, Tammy, I got this up here. Go down into the cabin and just try to get some rest. And Tammy was very grateful and she agreed. She opened the doors to the cabin and she had made it all the way down. Did this say real photo? Is this the real photo or no? Maybe or is like it was a just a real, real photo, you know what I'm saying? Of something, mm -hmm. That'd be crazy if it's a real photo. And Tammy was very grateful and she agreed. She opened the doors to the cabin and she had made it all the way downstairs when she hears Richard yell out from up in the cockpit, Oh my God! Before a rogue wave comes crashing into their boat mm. head on, flipping the boat backwards like a backflip onto the top so it's upside down in the water. And Tammy would say it felt like someone ripped the boat out from under her feet. And then she came crashing down and smashed her head and was knocked unconscious. Yeah. When Tammy woke up 27 hours later, she was laying in the cabin against a chair and half on the ground. And she opens her eyes and the cabin she's in is half submerged and everything inside of it has either been thrown on the ground or it's been broken. There's papers, there's tools. I mean, the place is just a disaster down there. And she can tell the cabin is also slowly filling with water. After the boat had backflipped and Tammy had been knocked unconscious, it continued to get thrown around by waves before miraculously landing upright. Tammy could barely remember what happened and she's totally overwhelmed by what she's seeing. She's in shock and all she knows is she has to go up on deck to find Richard. And so she gets up and wades through the water. She gets to the stairs. She's yelling for Richard. She goes up on deck and she looked around and the boat was just ruined and she's yelling for Richard. She's looking around. He's nowhere to be found. And then she looks up at the cockpit where she last saw him and she can see his safety line that was attached to him keeping mm -hmm. him anchored to the boat was now dangling off the back of the boat she mm -hmm. ran to the back she looked and the safety harness had actually come undone it had been broken in the storm and richard was gone he had been swept wow. into the ocean and he was not wearing a life jacket and tammy would say he had actually taken it off earlier in the storm and left it down in the cabin and then when the storm was raging again he was back up top, anchored in place, and just didn't think to go down and get it. And they both were just not thinking about it. It was just one of those things in a really chaotic situation that got overlooked. And while Tammy wanted to grieve the loss of her fiance, it was like she couldn't. Her survival instincts were kicking in, and she knew if she didn't act quickly to fix this situation, she too would die. And so she began robotically taking stock of the boat's condition, and she saw the masts had broken clean off, the sails were now dragging in the water, the engine, the radio, the electronic navigation system, the emergency position indicator device, all of it was ruined. And so all alone in the middle of the ocean with nothing in sight, no ships, no land, no anything, on a ruined ship that is gradually sinking, after finding out your fiance has been swept out to his death in the middle of a storm, Tammy managed to stay composed 
and she built a makeshift sail and began sailing the ship, and she also began slowly pumping the water out of the cabin. She went back into the cabin and she discovered some of the almanacs were still in there, and she discovered there was a current that she thought she could get to, and so using just a sextant and a watch, she manually navigated this broken down ship using this makeshift sail into this current, and then for 41 days, she survived on wow. canned food and peanut butter, and she sailed 1,500 miles to Hawaii. And the whole time, she's thinking to herself, if my calculations are off, that this is not the current I'm supposed to be in, I will sail past Hawaii out into the open water and I will run out of food and water and I will die. Mm. But she didn't die because her calculations were spot on. Mm. When Tammy finally stepped foot on land in Hawaii, she was relieved that you know she had made it yeah. and that she was gonna live. But at the same time, she had this flood of emotions where she was suddenly so sad about the loss of Richard. Wow. It was like she really hadn't had a chance to grieve his loss because that whole time after the accident, she was focused on survival. And although Tammy would make a full recovery, it would take her six years to learn how to read again because of the head injury she sustained oh, when the boat capsized. Wow. But when she did regain that skill, she finally stopped and she wrote her and Richard's story in a book called Red Sky and Morning that became an international bestseller and was converted into a movie called Adrift. Wow. <laughs> You must have heard of the song. Um, I didn't hear. I haven't heard of the book, but the movie, yeah. Oh, uh, but that's crazy. So Richard just never was found again. That's sad in itself, though. That's sad. Well, I I say this. Don't know one hundred percent, maybe, but possibly, no, no, more than likely, no. Yeah, yeah. Just lost at sea. Damn. Mm. That's sad, bro. I got, I'm just like thinking, cause I'm just like, cause even during all that, like now your Richard is gone and you still have to like, I still got to do what I need to do to survive. Yeah. Like there's nothing you can, you can do at this point, but try to survive yourself. And honestly, peep this, I feel as though if Richard didn't tell her to go in, go down and go to sleep. Yeah, po yeah, that's a possibility. Both of them would have been, you know, a by by him telling her, "I got this, go get you some rest," and her going down mm -hmm. actually was probably possibly what, what saved, saved her you? life. That in itself is crazy. That yeah. was a that's a crazy story, Fact. and I'm wondering how she ever went back to the ocean after that. Because because such a traumatic experience, a lot of people wouldn't. They'd be like, "I'm cool." Like the other one we did with the yeah. dude. They'd be like, "I'm cool with the water. Right. I'm not going back out there." That's uh, that's it for me. Pay my share. I'm done. Yeah, yeah so. that's crazy, man. Growing up in southeastern Australia, Ricky McGee worked a variety of jobs, including being a carpet salesman, a prawn fisherman, a nightclub doorman, an electrician, and a bailiff. In 2006, when Ricky was 35, he was offered yet another new job in a government department in Western Australia. He accepted the job, hopped in his car, and began the long drive across the desert. While on the extremely desolate Buntine Highway, which is basically a road in the middle of the desert with nothing around, no people, no buildings, nothing, He's driving along and he sees a group of three men standing outside of their car. And so Ricky assumed they must have broken down. So he pulls over to ask if they need help. And they come up to him and they're, they're so gracious that he stopped. And they said, we ran out of gas. Can we hop in with you and ride up to the next town? And Ricky says, fine, climb on in. So the three men, they get in his car and they take off. And then after that, Ricky has no memory. He thinks one of them drugged him by putting something in his drink, which was sitting in the center console and was open, but he doesn't know for sure. Ricky remembers waking up and he was in a camp and he sat up and he was unrestrained and he looks out in front of him and the three guys that had gotten in the car with him were sitting on rocks looking at him and one of them had a gun that he was aiming at Ricky. And so Ricky's just looking around, not really sure what's going on. And one of them gets up and comes over and offers him water. Ricky takes a sip of the water because he's very thirsty and Ricky believes the water was poisoned as well because shortly after taking a sip, he passed out again. When Ricky wow. regained consciousness a second time, he couldn't move. It was dark and he felt something tugging at his skin. And as he's laying there, he realizes there is black plastic right over his face. He's been buried. And then he realizes there is a dingo that is standing on his chest that has tugged the plastic away from his face because the dog is trying to take a bite out of Ricky. But the dog... Hell no. Hold on. And I that's the reason why see. people said they do not pick up on the I don't pick up nobody. 
You just can't trust people, bro. That simple thing of, hey, yeah, I'll give you a ride. You slip some in my drink. Then you pick up that many? Nope. Nope. That already right there because it's, it's, nope. it's a lot of y'all. It's only one of me. It's three of y'all. I ain't got Eric time. Man. I ain't got time. That's crazy. Nope. And I could have got eight. Why you look at me like this? Y'all, y'all should have... I don't know if y'all saw them face like, you made. Like, what? Not only y'all... I'm trying to be good to y'all. Y'all do this to me. Y'all drug me. me. You, bur you bury me. Tech alive. I don't know if y'all thought I was, you know... Maybe inspired. maybe, maybe that next dose... Was supposed was, to take me yeah. out. But... And they probably was waiting to see if you was wake up. That's why they hit the gun drawn on you. Man, we just not getting in this Yeah, story, let's man. go. Let's get... Let's plastic away from his face because the dog is trying to take a bite out of Ricky but the dog is the one that saved his life by creating an air pocket in the mm -hmm. plastic. Ricky screamed at the dog. The dog panicked and leapt out of the hole and ran away and Ricky was able to work his finger up to this hole and pull it all the way open mm -hmm. and push himself out of the plastic and he realized there wasn't much dirt or rocks that had been placed over him. They probably thought he would just suffocate in the middle of the yeah. desert and no one's going to find him anyways but here he is and so he stands up in his grave and he looks around and there's no sign of the three men his car is gone he realizes they also took all of his clothing even his shoes what? he's got no food he's got no water he's in the middle of the desert there's no roads there's no people there's no buildings there's nothing at this point confusion overtook ricky because he just could not make sense of what had just happened to him who were these three people why did they attack him did they just want to steal his car were they prepared to kill him to take his car he just he couldn't understand it and so there was some shade behind a little bush and he sat down in the shade and he just sat there for several hours thinking, you know, what am I going to do? But not being one to let pessimism crowd his psyche, Ricky decides if he's going to survive, he needs to get up and get moving. After 10 days of just... I said this, maybe they took your clothes and everything also. So like if something does happen to you, do die, somebody come discover the body, they you can't be identified because people won't be able to say what the last thing you had on. Yeah. Because you don't have clothes on, so they can't identify you to be able to trace your steps. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That could be also the reason why they stripped down the clothes. Psyche, Ricky decides if he's going to survive, he needs to get up and get moving. After 10 days of just wandering through the desert and seeing nobody, he came across this fairly large water hole and he decided, you know what, I have a better chance of surviving if I just wait here until someone comes and rescues me than if I just keep walking through the desert where I'm bound to just eventually die. And so he makes a makeshift shelter next to this water hole and he begins to wait. After almost a week of being at the spot, Ricky had still not had a single thing to eat since this whole ordeal began. Jeez. And so he's sitting there, his stomach is in knots, he's in so much pain, he's starving. And just then a lizard happened to run across in front of him and without even thinking, he just reached out and grabbed it and took a bite out of it. And it was like all of a sudden this primal side of him was unleashed and suddenly he had no issues eating anything that moved in the desert. For weeks, Ricky stayed at the spot drinking from the water hole and eating lizards, frogs, leeches, snakes, grasshoppers, caterpillars, yeah. basically anything that moved anywhere in the desert, he would chase it down and he would eat it. In fact, he developed an affinity for certain frogs over others, and he said in terms of eating leeches that they were okay, but you needed to eat them really, really quickly, otherwise they would attach to the insides of your mm -hmm. mouth. Ricky also ate plants, but he would even say he had no idea what was harmful and what was okay to eat. He just ate what tasted good and got really lucky. But as much as Ricky was eating, it wasn't enough. He was slowly losing his battle with the desert, and he was starving to death. And so Ricky believed he didn't have enough time to just continue to wait at this particular spot. He needed to go out and find help. And so he left that water hole and began stumbling through the desert all over again. But he was so weak, he only lasted for a couple of days before he found another water hole, and he stopped there and he built yet another shelter, this time believing it would become his tomb. Over the next couple of days, wild dogs began coming to his camp and circling his camp. It was like they knew he was about to die soon, or they at least knew he was weak enough they could probably overpower him soon. At night, Ricky had to barricade the door of his shelter because the dogs would get aggressive and they'd come up to the door and try to paw their way inside. On the 70th day of his ordeal, Ricky believed he was probably within a day or two of passing away, 
And so he put a cross on the outside of his shelter, believing that would be his tomb. And at least this way, someone might notice it and find his body and then hopefully let his family know what happened to him. But on the 71st day, when Ricky happened to be standing outside of his shelter, two ranch hands happened to be way off the road in the outback and were looking in his direction and they saw him. And when they went over to him, they said he looked like a walking skeleton wow. and Ricky practically collapsed as soon as he saw help had finally arrived. The ranch hands evacuated Ricky from the desert and brought him to a hospital wow. where he weighed less than 100 pounds. Wow. At the beginning yes, of his yes. ordeal, he weighed over 230 pounds. Jesus. Despite filing a report with the police about the three men who attacked him, they were never caught. Ricky checked himself out of the hospital after six days and made a full recovery. He ended up writing a book about his experience and he now works construction in Dubai. That's crazy. Oh, he just, he moved whole countries, girl. That's he crazy. Left, he left and went to Dubai. That see, and that's the reason why people say, like, even though it's it's wow. it's so like like damn, you can't help. But it's like, bro, I don't know what you want. And a lot of people who be on some BS yeah. do be on. And over time, you know, I guess like with situation or just hearing things, you kind of have to like really. Like, no matter how, like, good you are and your heart is and you want to help, sometimes you just got to be like, <laughs> like, you know my heart. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I just can't. Especially if you by yourself. Me, personally. I told by you. Myself, I just can't. I told you about one of the, one of my mentors growing up, uh, Mr. Will. Mm -hmm. That man had money. Mm -hmm. He was a rich, rich, he was a rich white man. What but, about him now? But he, he literally, like, on his way to work, you know what I'm saying? To the J, he used to, he said him, he ain't mind, like, picking up his hockey. Yeah. He said, because he was very, he was like, because you, you never know what predicament or what, who who they are, where they come from, or yeah. what blessing they could be onto you. So he was like, he ain't never, I was like, bro, you don't never I think. guess you got to have some good discernment, child. But he was uh, like, as soon as they get in the car, he go to preaching that word. I, I child, said, child, that's what's up. <laughs> they, <laughs> might, they might be like, all right, he, like, little, like, he might be too crazy. <laughs> Like, hold on now. But yeah, he said, you know what I'm saying? He, he had yeah. those conversations with him and he'd be like, he asked him, you know what I'm saying? How they how they walk with Christ yeah. and all that stuff. And I was like, and that's be the topic of the conversation. And he'll drive him up to where he's going. And then from there, you know what I'm saying? He'll yeah. send him on their way, get him something to eat or something. Yeah. He was a good man though. Yeah. Like he was, he was, he was just very well a good, off. A good man. Yeah, I'm yes, talking, you know what I'm saying? Right. I was like, hey, yeah. Mr. Will, you know what I'm saying? But yeah. Yeah, he used to come school me up to go go to Bible study and stuff. Out at of, out of Mr. Nick's house. Mm -hmm. one of the, they rich, rich, you know what I'm saying? I said, oh, rich, that money stay with money. <laughs> but no, nah, they was good people, man. They was very good people. Helped me change my life a lot. But, you know what I'm saying? Like, it just having some of the conversation he would have, mm -hmm. he like you just you just realize there are real good people in the world, but there are very evil people that prey on good people too. Yeah. So you gotta be, even though you want to be good, sometimes you just have to realize the world you live in as well, mm -hmm. and realize that even though I want to be a blessing, some people want to be a curse, and in this situation, <laughs> some people want to be a curse, and like what's the hell? What, what like? Why were y'all robbing him? Why did this y'all try? But you oh, know, for a car? It, it, Could be just for a car. But I'm thinking about it. If I, nine times out of ten, it had to be. Because I'm like, y'all already had poison or whatever. So it, it could have been anyone. No, Anybody that been. picked them up, yeah. they was going to do this too. So, but to be honest, for y'all to already have, have a, a poison. And y'all have a gun. Like, y'all already They were like, already on some bulls. You know bulls. what I'm saying? But for them to already have a poison and all that. Y'all, that's what y'all do. That's what, this is something. It's not a first, it's it not just a first, was, And it wasn't first just, time. the victim was random, but the, the act, was random, but the act but... wasn't random. That was, that's crazy. And then bury him in shadow grave. Y'all was able to get some plastic. Y'all already had that on you? That's, that in itself was crazy. That's crazy. Man, that's yeah, that's was... a lot of evil people, so you definitely have to be careful and just. Yeah, treasure on the server, right? Yep, yeah, always. By 1985, the remote and extremely dangerous west face of the Ciula Grande in the Peruvian Andes was still unclimbed. But in 1985, two very ambitious climbers, 25-year-old Joe Simpson and 21-year-old Simon Yates, decided they were going to be the first to conquer it. And by all accounts, they seemed up for the job, having already conquered numerous difficult Scottish ice cliffs 
as well as a number of large mountain faces in the Alps. So in early June of that year, the pair flew to Peru and they arrived at the base camp that was nearest to the Ciula Grande, but it was still five miles away, so they couldn't actually see what they were gonna be climbing yet. On June 5th, when the weather was good enough, the pair left camp and worked their way around the huge lake, across the glacier, to the base of this cliff they're about to climb. And when they saw it for the first time, they couldn't believe how steep and dangerous it looked. But over the next three days, they managed to make it up this cliff despite a blizzard hitting them halfway through, and they reached the summit. To them, this was a crowning achievement. They had done it. They had written their names in the history books. But in reality, the thing that people would remember them for was not for reaching the top of Ciula Grande. It was for what happened when they started going down. Because of how steep this mountain was, and because of the blizzard that was not going away, it was actually getting worse, the descent was going to be much more challenging than the ascent. So shortly after 10 a.m. on June 8th, Joe and Simon left the summit and began very carefully making their way down the mountain. At 11 a.m., disaster struck when Joe lost his footing and fell to the bottom of an ice cliff and shattered his leg. Initially, they both assumed this was a death sentence for Joe because there's no way he can actually climb down the mountain now, and certainly Simon can't actually carry him down the mountain. They were so high up, and it's so steep. There's just no way. But Simon wanted to at least try to save his friend, so he climbed down to him. He gave him some mild painkillers that he had, and then he attached his rope to Joe, and then Simon anchored himself in the snow, and he began lowering Joe down the mountain, all 300 feet of his rope. And when he would stop, Joe at the other end would anchor himself in the snow with his ice picks, uh -huh. and then Simon would climb down to Joe, and he'd repeat the process over and over and over again, lowering Joe 300 feet at a time. This went on for hours and hours and hours, just backbreaking work for Simon. And Joe, meanwhile, is in excruciating pain from his broken leg. And to make matters worse, the storm had gotten so bad that the visibility between Simon and Joe was zero. Uh -huh. So as Simon is lowering Joe, he can't see what he's lowering Joe onto, but they had no other choice. That was the only way they could get him down. And so at 5 p.m. that night, Simon accidentally lowers Joe over a cliff. And Joe, as soon as he's hanging off the edge, all of his weight is on the rope, and suddenly the rope is flying out of Simon's hands, and he manages to self-arrest and stop him from careening over the edge. But now, Simon is the only thing holding Joe from tumbling to his death. And Simon is being slowly drugged down the mountain. He can't anchor himself in. And so they're in the middle of this inhospitable environment, in the middle of the night, a storm is raging, it's freezing cold, they can't communicate with each other. They can't hear each other or see each other. And Simon is just hoping that Joe is going to be able to grab onto something and kind of take his weight off the rope. Otherwise, this is going to end badly for both of them. But unfortunately, the cliff was at an angle, so Joe was dangling off of it, and he couldn't touch the wall. He had nothing to grab onto. He was just dangling in the air. And so as Simon tries to move the rope to try to signal to Joe to take your weight off the rope, Joe is trying to climb up the rope, but his hands are starting to get frosted bit. He's weak. He's in pain. He can't do anything about it. So for the next two and a half hours, Simon is desperately trying to regain an anchor in the snow. But every second that goes by, he's getting pulled farther and farther and farther down the mountain. He can't. That is cr I'm, oh man, for two and a half hours, I'm over here. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's but too much. Up, but I give up. <laughs> Don't you give up on me, okay? <laughs> this ain't about you, see. I'm saying, I'm see, saying. See, like, I'm Joe, you sobbing. I'm yeah. Joe, don't you give up on me. I need you to help, too, I'll pull your I'm weight, done. literally. I'm doing what I can, for real, though. Bro, like, you better hobble on that one leg or something, bro. We, we, hey, we both can't be I'm dead. I'm do my part, you but. Better, you better die and let me live or something. <laughs> That's why I don't look. Every second that goes by, he's getting pulled farther and farther and farther down the mountain. He can't see how close he is to the edge. He knows he's getting close. Oh, and so finally crazy. at 7.30 p.m. with no other option, he pulls out a knife and he cuts the rope. As soon as the rope was cut, Simon fell backwards. He was safe. Nothing was pulling him off the cliff any longer. But he knew he had just sent Joe to his death. Except Joe didn't die. When that rope was cut, he fell 150 feet and smashed into the ground, except what he hit was a thin sheet of ice that broke from his weight, and he fell another 80 feet into this massive ice crevasse. 
Joe was knocked unconscious from the fall, but when he woke up, he was laying on his side. He opened his eyes and he looked around and he couldn't believe he was alive. And he's looking around. He doesn't know where he is. It's totally dark. He turns on his headlamp and he realizes he's fallen into an ice crevasse and he looks down and he's on this little ledge that's overlooking a much, much deeper fall. He looks down and this oh ice crevasse gosh. seems to just go on infinitely into this black chasm. And he realizes when he fell, had he fallen a foot over, that's where he would have gone. So it's a miracle he's alive, but now he's trapped in the middle of an ice crevasse 80 feet down. He can't go down and he can't go up. At the time, Joe didn't know if Simon had fallen off the cliff with him or if he had cut the rope. But the rope was still attached to his waist and it fed up and out of the ice crevasse. And so he grabbed it and pulled on it until it all came tumbling back down and he saw it was frayed. And so sure enough, Simon had cut the rope. Now, even though Joe wasn't mad at Simon for the decision he made because he understood it was the right one, Joe still became very emotional when he saw this. He felt so alone. He was so sad. And for a little while, he just kind of freaked out and screamed and yelled and See, get the tears out your eyes. Yo, I'm just like... See, get the because, tears Because, you know, I'm eyes. just I'm like, dang, it's like, I I know we're not finished, but it's like, like, so messed up for Joe, but then it's like Simon had to make a hard decision, and it was just, it's a lot. Like, you know, if you ever been like in a situation, and it's like, you either gotta choose... Me, us, or me. Like, I'm trying, like, I've done all I can for us, yeah. but nothing, it's either we both going down... Or I have to make a decision, you know what I'm saying? And that's, that's... Alone, he was so sad, and for a little while, he just kind of freaked out and screamed and yelled and really just didn't know what he was going to do. And then after that, he sat down knowing he wasn't getting out of here and that he was going to die a slow, horrible, painful death. Joe remembers reaching up and turning off his headlamp, which retrospectively he thought was kind of goofy because he's just realized he's about to die inside of this crevasse and he's saving batteries. But with the light off, he's sitting on the ledge and he hears all the sounds that are coming from inside of this crevasse. It was this awful grinding sound, like a moaning sound. And he said it was so terrifying sitting in the darkness, listening to the nice. sound that he reached up and turned his light back on just for comfort. Back up on the mountain, Simon was devastated. He felt like he had just killed his friend. And even though he understood why he did it and understood it was probably the right decision, it didn't change the fact that he felt incredibly guilty about it. And so that night, he didn't even move from the position he was. He dug a little snow cave and he laid down and eventually fell asleep. The next morning when he got up, he began moving his way down the mountain and he finally rounded the area where Joe had been hanging off of that cliff and he got a chance to look down and see where Joe might have wound up. And to his horror, he's looking down and he sees this massive opening to a crevasse that seemed almost bottomless. And now this confirms that Joe definitely has died because he fell in there. But nonetheless, Simon goes down and goes to the edge of the crevasse and yells into Joe. He's screaming for him to call out if he's still alive. But after a while, he never heard anything from Joe. And with a heavy heart, Simon turned around and started heading back to base camp. A little while after Simon had left, Joe finally woke up. He had been asleep when Simon was yelling down for him. And so Joe wakes up, he's looking around, he can't believe this wasn't a bad dream. He starts yelling for Simon because he doesn't know what else to do. But after a while, he realized Simon's not gonna come down here to get me. He cut the rope, he thinks I'm dead already. At this point, Joe decides he needs to try to climb out of the crevasse, even with a broken leg. And so he gets himself in position, he gets his ice picks, and he oh, starts Joe. making his way up this ice wall, but he can't put any weight on his broken leg, and he keeps falling down, and he's realizing, I can't climb this. I probably couldn't climb this with two good legs, let alone with this broken one. And so Joe had two choices. He could wait on the ledge and hope to be rescued, but by his calculations, it was unlikely someone was going to come out here and rescue him anytime soon, because Simon is going to say, he's dead. So wait on the ledge and probably die a slow, painful death. Or he can go down deeper into the crevasse, which he has no idea where it goes, and hope somewhere down in that black void, there's an opening that leads back out to the outside mm. of the mountain. So he made his choice, screwed an anchor into mm. the ice, put his rope through it. He tested it to make sure it would hold his weight. He looked down into the void one last time and knew that as soon as he stepped off of this ledge, he could not come back up again. This was a one-way trip. And if he made it to the bottom of his 300 foot rope and he didn't find a ledge or a tunnel or something to put his feet on, he would slip off and fall to his death on purpose. He did not put a knot at the end of his rope because he figured either I'll find a way out or I won't, but at least it'll be quick. Down he went about 80 feet into this pitch black crevasse. He has no idea what's down there. 
And he gets to a point where the walls kind of come together and he was able to squeeze through it. And he realized once he got through that point, it was like the center of an hourglass where below it, it kind of opened up. And as soon as he pushed through, he could actually see to the ground. He saw flat ground and there was light shining on it, which meant okay. there was a hole leading okay. out into the mountains somewhere down there. And so he went all the way down. He touched the bottom. It was solid ground. He disconnected from his rope and he climbed his way up this incline to where the sun was coming Watch in, out. which was this hole that led right back out onto the mountain. And sure enough, he crawled out and tumbled out and the sun is shining on him. And he remembers just laying on the mountain, looking at the sun and laughing. He couldn't believe it. But after the initial relief of not dying wore off, he realized he was not out of the woods yet. Right. He still needed to climb down the rest of the mountain. And there wasn't that much left to climb. He was towards the bottom and it wasn't that steep. But after that, he would need to navigate five miles back to base camp. But over several delirious, painful, miserable mm. days, he managed to crawl all the way back to base Come camp on, and he got there right as Simon was packing up the tent and getting ready to leave. Oh, he... no. Hell no. Sorry, mom said I was just no. took me out, Chow. That's crazy. <laughs> that is the craziest you could ever oh. see. Simon oh is getting ready. Well, Joe's dead. He done probably worked to, up the, he done probably to worked the up all the story in his head. He like, hey, I got this story then in my head. I gotta head. go back and tell your family. Yo, oh Lord, where the I body really... at? You gotta just. What happened? I had to cut the rope. You cut I had the to make, rope. I had to make a decision. I tried. Like what? Mm -mm. And you dealing with that regret and that grief? Like, come on now. He been grieving. Ooh. And then all of a sudden, he's like, damn. If I'm, um, am I dead too? <laughs> damn, I thought you was a ghost. <laughs> You over here got tears in your eyes. And he and got shit. there right as Simon was packing up the tent and getting ready to leave. He could not believe he saw Joe alive. Joe said Simon just swore. He just endlessly swore. He was cussing. He couldn't even speak. He didn't understand. It was like he was looking at a ghost. But after that kind of crazy initial interaction, Simon just gave Joe a big hug. And Joe and Simon just cried and held oh. each other. Joe underwent six surgical operations to repair Jeez. the damage done to his leg. And doctors would tell him that you're never going to climb again. And you're probably going to struggle with walking for the rest of your life. But oh, after two years of intense rehabilitation, Joe was not only walking just fine, he was mountain climbing. As for Simon, <laughs> no. he managed to leave the mountain without any serious physical injury, but he carried with him an enormous sense of guilt that he still carries today. Joe consistently says Simon made the right decision. In every interview he does, he always makes sure to say Simon is not at fault. It was an impossible situation. He made the right call. Joe wrote a book about the experience called Touching the Void, and it sold millions of copies worldwide and has since been adapted into a major motion picture. As for Joe and Simon, apparently they've drifted apart over the years, but they still consider each other friends. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret. I found the secret. It was a thumbs up. Lock it in with a thumbs up. You found a secret? You never. <laughs> oh my gosh. That was the I'm crazy gonna have story. to go read the book. I'm gonna have to go that read. was the motion motion picture film too, so it's got a it's a well, film. Okay, I can read the book and then watch the movie. But oh my goodness. That was dope. I mean not dope, but I mean dope. It's a nice <laughs> Dope ending. Dope story, though. Yeah, dope ending. Dope, I'm just, no, I'm saying Okay, dope, dope story. Because it's like, damn, bro, y'all went, really went through that Yo, shit? This, this story took me through it, child. I'm like, what? I hate they drifted apart, but I mean, you know. That's life. I get it. That's life. That's you know, life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Whatever. But, um, wow. That's amazing, man. Amazing most story. Most definitely. Most definitely. You supposed to be left for dead, and you like, <laughs> still alive. I'm still alive. <laughs> real though. Determined, honey. Yeah, man. To live. That's crazy. <laughs> Very okay. much so, man. Mm -hmm. But hey, man, y'all spam us up, man. These were some good stories, bro. Yeah, All, they were. Only one, like the Tammy and Richard, though. Yeah, that was sad. That was very sad because... Because Richard, you know... Well, all of them still sad. No, 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 no. They all so sad. But I said sad. unfortunately, Richard did lose his life. Someone actually, you know, and, lost their life. You know what I'm saying? With his fiance and yeah. everything. You know what I'm saying? And even her her experience of having to even learn how to read six, took her six years. Six years. To learn how to even read, yeah. like, the functionalities of it. Because she still had brain right. damage. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that in itself. And then not having Richard's body. Yeah. 
that's also traumatic in a, in a sense. So yeah, she still probably is. is dealing with that. Uh, it happened in 83, so I don't know where yeah. she is. But she probably dealt with that for a long time. Long time. If not, still dealing with it. Because that's still a survivor's guilt, too. And then you got Ricky, buried alive. Yeah, literally. To, and by the grace of a dog, I'm, I'm, I was able to battle back, yeah. fight. And literally fought to the to the end. To the end. Did you see on his back he had like a cross on his back? Yeah, it was something like like was it? A did t- you did you see that? I did. I cause I was looking. I was like, is that a tattoo? That didn't look like a tattoo. It looked like heat, like a heat was cross. Was it a heat cross? Yeah, like I couldn't tell what it was. Yeah, but it literally looks yeah, like it does. It's a cross that's f- from heat from the sun. I see. I couldn't unless tell. he had something on his back. <clears throat> Cause that's a cross imprint. Yeah, it is. It is a. I don't know if it's from him leaning up against something or if it was. He did. He said he had he a makeshift. Make, yeah. Make so cross. I don't so know. So he if probably just sat there and it, and it imprinted on his skin. That's yeah. crazy in itself, though. Damn. Yeah. He fought, man. Literally. And then the shout out to Joe and Simon. Because not out. not only did Joe go through, Simon, Simon went through hell Simon too. Went through, because that's. that's that's a lot on your mental. Not even that. Them having a battle for hours. Well, that too. Well, that's, that's on that's your mental strength. too. Yeah. And not knowing if if y'all gonna even you know be able to make it down the hill. So yeah. So. Hey man, spam us up in the comments. Y'all let us know y'all Please thoughts do. down below, man. But it's always. I do go by the name DJ B Kid. This is you are. We are. Go and get it. Ain't no time to kick it. Got a stack of flip for my foes. Dollar, 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 dollar. Please tell me you can hear me. Don't turn your back and don't neglect me. Just let me know if you need me. Dollar, 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 dollar.